Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Hope you're doing well today. My name is Miller and I'm here uh, this week with you. I'm sharing on the themes of the body, the breath and connection. Um, and if any of you were here yesterday, you'll see that I'm in a different space uh, than I was uh, before because I'm traveling. So um, I'm in a new space. So let me just uh, see if there's, if my sound is okay. Feel free to uh, let me know or if there's any comments and I can see what I can fiddle with. Um, and my plan uh, sounds fine. Okay, okay, brilliant. Thank you very much. There's quite a lot of traffic noise behind me. Um, I'm in Cambridge. Uh, so, but with these headphones, I think it, it, it manages it very well. All right. So um, today uh, I'm planning to speak a little bit share a few ideas um, on these themes, breath, body, connection. Um, then I'll share a guided practice um, focused on the breath um, and then leave plenty of time for silent, uh, quiet practice together. Um, we'll then have time for questions and reflections um, over the chat um, or in person if anyone really wants to come on screen. Um, and as yesterday, I uh, hope to encourage you to share um, your reflections about your practice um, in the chat as a way to kind of share the experience more fully with one another in community and to reach out to each other if that's something you'd like to do. No obligation at all. So I'm here to kind of hold this space for your practice. Um, so I'm going to offer a few prompts and then um, get, a, get out of the way. Uh, for your practice to unfurl. All right. So um, today, as I said, I'll be talking a little bit about the breath and focusing in our practice um, on the breath. And uh, particularly how it can be a useful tool for uh, working in a meditation session um, with each of the different parts. Um, you may or may not structure your meditation when you're practicing. I think it's it can be a useful thing to, to experiment with, to play with. Um, and so, yeah, I'll offer some ideas about that. So it can be used in, a, in different ways in different parts of a meditation practice and also in different ways to connect with some Buddhist insights and ideas. And I should say, when I talk about structuring a meditation practice, this is a pragmatic, personal, uh, work-a-day kind of thing um, that, you know, if it doesn't work for you and it doesn't feel right, then uh, of course it's not uh, something you need to do or to follow or to worry about. So I'll, I'll tell you what I mean by using the breath in the way uh, I, I structure, a pra uh, you, can, you can structure a practice. At the beginning of a session, sometimes I take a few deeper than usual breaths and sometimes really sighing out or even a little bit of a yawn on the out breath. And you're, well, feel free to try that wherever you are. Just a kind of deeper than usual breath. And um, even like vocalizing a little bit, um, just over the sigh, ah. um, or formal chanting, um, that can help to settle the use of the voice in that way. Another option that I like, which um, I discovered through yoga practice, is pausing a little bit at the bottom of the out breath. So there's a natural kind of lull at the end of an out breath and then before the in breath. As of taking that lull and extending it a little bit. It doesn't need to be extended by more than a second or you can extend it for longer. But 
I call that a paused breath. And doing that a few times. And as I said, feel free to experiment with that, have a go as I'm talking and maybe during the practice. Um, so that's part of my settling process as I'm kind of getting into a sit. And then once I'm kind of settled and I'm sitting, um, perhaps doing some mindfulness or some concentration practice or some meta practice, whatever it is that I'm uh, choosing that day. Typically, I find that my attention does not easily stay. So I'm usually thinking about embodied an embodied approach. So I'm coming into the body, resting my attention on some part of my physical experience as a way to kind of bring my mind into uh, the direct experience of living. And I find that my attention does not easily stay. Um, for me, I go into planning or sometimes narration. I seem to narrate my experience to somebody else as it's happening. Or these days, I'm thinking more about teaching. I think, how, how would I... How would I support someone else through this uh, wavering of attention? So I end up taking myself away from my practice in that way. And lots of people have, you know, different patterns in the way mind wanders off, um, whether it's looking to the future, looking to the past, looking to happy things, looking to unhappy things, more about people or more about anything else that's uh, kind of on your mind. In any case, the monkey mind, as they call it, the monkey mind, the mischievous mind, which naturally wanders off, wanders off and plays. Totally normal thing for a monkey mind to do. Nothing to feel bad about. But as this is a process of training our minds, this practice, um, we use some gentle guidance with ourselves and say, ah, I noticed this thinking or in my case, this planning or this narrating or this fight that I'm having with someone who isn't actually here, or this rumination over something in the past, or this anxiety about something in the future that hasn't happened. And I can say, thanks mind, I can see that you're trying to help. I can see that you have a really strong habit here. But right now I'm doing steady embodied attention training. So uh, let's come back. And then I'm beginning again with my meditation. There's this sense of kind of re-entering or starting again. And so I find it helpful to settle again, you know, as I, as I often do at the beginning of a practice. I might take a couple of paused breaths again to re-establish myself or have a sigh or a stretch. But often it's in the breath. So there's a kind of a cycle of Settling, entering practice, mind pattern showing up, thought pattern, emotion pattern showing up, noticing that, ah, there's a pattern. Sometimes helpful to name it, label it, or note it. Oh, look, planning. Okay. And then come back using this uh, tool of the stopped breath or the paused breath to kind of bring my attention back in. So I'm settling myself, re-softening any bracing or tense effort, aiming to create a space of relaxed energy, this lovely kind of place between being kind of rigid and trying very hard and being, uh, you know, floppy, where you're, where it's a space between being sort of grounded and awake, grounded and open, relaxed effort relaxed energy and re-emerge into the experience of what's happening, what's really going on. So that's two ways uh, uh, that the breath can be used at different parts of the meditation practice, the, the settling at the beginning, the, the re-establishment, the re-establishment in the embodied experience after uh, mind patterns have emerged. 
And then there's contemplation or using breath as a focus. Contemplation of the body in the body, so the breathing body in the breathing body, entering into as much as possible the direct experience. Using the breath to focus and to rest there in that remembering, that clear, energetic inhabiting of my experience as my body breathes in and out and in and out. And after a while, I may become further settled into practice. and I'm less being pulled about by thoughts and distractions. And by resting with experience, it's a different form of uh, contemplation in a way. Steadier, maybe resting for a bit longer. And then it's a good time for insight practice or contemplation of core Buddhist ideas. Um, and I can invite an, an idea to the party, to the meditation party that's going on. Perhaps the idea of anatta, anatta or non-self. The idea that our selves are not fixed or permanent. That we're more like a process than, than like a thing. As I breathe, I can experience the way in which I am not still or fixed. The breath is moving me at all times including when I'm not really thinking about it or when I'm asleep. And the breath is also allowing my body to be connected uh, with everything else. I'm exchanging carbon dioxide, water vapor, oxygen and other things with the air around me. I'm swapping elements in and out between my body and the environment. I'm ever changing. I'm kind of... Uh, into being with everything else. When I breathe, I'm taking in some of the oxygen that the tree outside the window is breathing out. And some of the carbon dioxide I exhale will be taken up by that tree and the other plants outside. And combined with sunlight from our star, 93 million miles away. Sunlight that's taken just over eight minutes to get here. So the leaves of the tree and all the plants outside will take this sunlight from 93 million miles away and the carbon dioxide from my breath a few meters away and combine them, becoming the food that I'll eat later in the year. So just in the breath, there's this insight of being a process, ever moving, ever shifting, not fixed. And there's a sense of being radically interconnected in a way that's at the same time very everyday and very miraculous and cosmic. And it's all here in breathing in and breathing out. And I can, or we can start to kind of scratch at the sides of this, start to access these uh, embodied insights when the monkey mind settles for long enough for them to emerge. So to summarize, breath as a way to transition into practice, breath as a focus for training steady embodied awareness, for training the steady, relaxed, open, curious, focused mind and the breath as a place for insight, contemplation, and the flourishing of the sensation of embodied insights, which can then become part of how we live our lives, how we find ourselves experiencing the world, how we make choices, and so on. So, with all that in mind, uh, Please go ahead and prepare to uh, sit, to prepare to practice, uh, whether you're sitting or standing or lying down or any other shape or combination. Feel free to make any, any stretches or wriggles or yawns that you'd like. And maybe a few slightly deeper than usual breaths.
and starting with gratitude for this practice of liberation, for those who've gone before us, developed and shared it, including the Buddha, many others, both within and before and outside this particular tradition. All the things and the people and the systems that have supported them, all that work and generosity that's gone before, enabling these teachings and practices to thrive, to survive, so that we can practice them today. Thanking our teachers, any particular teachers who've been part of this sharing across time and space that we can now share in too. And all enablers and supporters of our practice, seen and unseen. So in gratitude, checking in with how you're doing right now. Is there anything that you need in your posture, in your physical being to be settled? Feel free to make that change. Settling, softening, if there are any areas of tension or bracing that can be invited to soften. And then if you like, um, taking three of these paused breaths I talked about. And I'll suggest doing this three times with a return to usual breathing in between. And again, if this doesn't kind of feel quite right or you'd like, to, you prefer not to do it, then no need. But as an experiment, in the process of settling, I'm gonna take three of these paused breaths. Pausing for a second or so longer at the bottom of the out breath before I take the next in breath. And return to normal breathing pattern. And then pause breathing. And then usual breathing pattern. And then paused breathing. Last time. Usual breathing pattern, connecting with your experience, sensing into the physical sensation of your breathing, whether that's in your chest or your belly, throat, mouth and nose, or the whole body sensation of breathing. Feel free to choose 
uh, one of these. Something that, it might, that might work for you this session. Inhabiting your body breathing in your body breathing. The sheer physical reality of your embodied here and now. In this breath, in this movement. And we'll practice like this quietly together. Anytime you notice mind patterns emerging, to come back to your practice, perhaps with a sigh or some stopped breathing, some paused breathing. allowing the monkey mind to settle again and yourself to settle into the physical experience of your body breathing.
And as we come to the last few minutes of practice, inviting some gratitude for Buddha, awakeness, and teacher, the Buddha, for the Dharma, for the teachings, the Sangha community of practice, which we are here today, and for breath and body and connection, gratitude for all these things and the ways in which connection runs through all these things. most alive right now in this sangha of people breathing together, settling in to their embodied realities together. So now transitioning, coming to the end of this practice session together. Thank you for your practice and thank you for practicing in community. It means a lot. And I wonder how things are. You're very welcome to share any reflections on your experience in the chat. To help keep getting to know each other and supporting one another in this practice. It can be something that's very helpful to others to hear what's going on, if that appeals to you. And I'd also like to offer you an invitation uh, to pick an element of the practice today to sort of drop in to the rest of your day. Perhaps that would be taking three paused breaths or some of, the, of these slightly vocal sighs, these big sighs, or perhaps in your practice an insight emerged or a way of working with your moment-to-moment -moment experience that you can experiment with, just allowing it to be present in your day, picking a few moments to give to that, to give back to that. And then I'll also invite you, anyone who comes along tomorrow, <laughs> to share about that if you like or you could use the community bit of the Sangha Live platform and then of course you're also very welcome to share any questions uh, with me I had a couple left over from yesterday too um, and also to mention Dana as you know this platform runs on generosity so uh, please feel free to share Dana 
uh, with Sangha Live, and I might say a bit more about that right at the end. Um, I'm going to see if I can do my job and put the uh, put the link in the chat. Oh, for some reason, I'm not able to. Oh, right, not today. Anyway, hopefully, you know the uh, the Donna link, and it'll appear at the end as well. Thank you, George. Oh, now I see it. There we go. <coughs> Okay, so I see a question from Vanya. Some days I'm very distractible and give in to my distractions after about 20 minutes out of the meditation, check my phone, etc. I don't know what to do other than the obvious, which is stop it. Um, <laughs> yeah, like the joke when somebody goes to the therapist office and talks about their problems and the therapist just leans forward and says, just stop. <laughs> Not such useful advice. Um, so, when distractions are very strong, um, I think there's probably two, well, many ways, but two ways that come to mind for me um, to work with them. One is to look underneath them a little bit. So, to see what type of distraction is emerging. Um, I spoke yesterday about, you know, in response to someone's question about a recurrent argument uh, that I sometimes have uh, as a distraction in meditation. And when, or there might be planning or there might be other things. I wonder if there's a pattern in the distraction and if there's an emotional kind of force underneath that type of distraction that you might be able to investigate and care for. So for me, it's feeling insecure about something. I end up having a fight with someone in my head because if I win the fight, I'll feel better. I, which, you know, it's an imaginary fight. I don't win it or feel better, but for some reason, there's that energy to do it. And um, if I have the presence of mind and I recognize what's happening, instead of just, as you say, giving in and engaging with that pattern, if I choose instead to think, right, how can I take care of this sense of insecurity? It can take a little bit of the force out of it. So I wonder if there are times where the distraction isn't actually what's going on, but it's a response to something that needs to be taken care of. So that's one approach. Another approach is to use a timer and to be in some ways a bit old fashioned. I don't know if you already use a timer, but to commit to staying even if you're distracted, to not giving yourself the option, to leave your phone in a different room, to put in place some of these almost physical boundaries um, around your practice. A timer, you don't get up until it goes off. Uh, no, no, e no, nothing within reach. <laughs> um, Nothing, so you'd have to physically get up in order to uh, scratch that itch. Putting in place these little boundaries. Um, I hope that's helpful. A couple of ways, at least, looking underneath and then thinking about setting up some boundaries for yourself. Um, there was a question yesterday about um, finding ways to relax when life is very busy, to make moments for relaxation. And I, I have a couple of suggestions for that. And they're both, uh, they're both centered in the body. So how to sort of contact an element of calmness or practice within the body um, during the day. But they're about different uses of, of time so one way to create uh, moments is, is to create like micro moments. Um, for instance, um, taking three breaths. Only three breaths, I mean, it's going to be less than a minute, a lot less than a minute. Um, but to start there and to establish a pattern either of uh, doing that at particular times during the day, um, like literally at 
nine o'clock at 12 o'clock or you know specific times that you agree with yourself um, or to to do it at specific moments in terms of the process of your day so for instance making tea or preparing a meal um, or even going to the bathroom um, or if there's a commute that you're doing um, something that you're doing regularly uh, to kind of attach uh, a minute or two to uh, do whatever it is that you've that you're choosing as a relaxation practice um, with three breaths or having a stretch um, or lying on the floor taking a moment to lie on the floor so you can't actually do anything else um, yeah those would be a couple of ways and years ago I actually made a video about this um, so I'm gonna put the I'm gonna put the video in the chat uh, if anyone is interested in that as well I'll put that in whenever the, my chat box arrives again all right so let me see we're coming to the end of our session now I'll say a little bit more about Dana I think um, and also if you have any other questions feel free um, so Sangha Live runs on on Dana on uh, the generosity uh, of the financial support um, of the people who take part um, that helps Sangha Live to say stay sustainable and this week it'll help me stay sustainable which partly means um, paying the bills and you know buying food and that kind of thing but also um, supporting my work um, my other work in the world um, and some of that is around working with uh, charities and uh, not-for-profit groups and some of it is to do with taking action to disrupt harmful power uh, in the world uh, what you can also call activism I like to call disrupting organizing to disrupt harmful power um, and there are two projects with whom I will be sharing uh, my dana this week uh, one is um, organizing to disrupt the harmful power pattern of politicians taking oil money and then looking after oil money interests at this time of climate crisis. And the other is supporting the well-being of people who do this sort of organizing. So the first is a campaign called Stop Polluting Politics. And the second is a new group called CAN, which stands for Culture, Action and Nurture. So if you've been wondering how or looking for ways to contribute to this kind of work, particularly around climate justice, climate crisis, then please feel free to share your dana this week. And that's where it'll be going, you know, the bit that comes to me. All right. Okay. Someone has in asked if I am Swiss, <laughs> which is really interesting. No, I'm not. Um, I am half Czech and half British. Um, right. Uh, question. Ooh, do you have an idea to look and feel into dependent origination during the day? Areas or themes which are more helpful for it? Wow, what a great question. Um, others, uh, please feel free to offer um, your thoughts. Um, and uh, yes, I see your question, Claire. Um, so, um, wow, feeling into dependent origination. Well, I think quite visually and I, I often imagine this as kind of streams through time and streams across space. Um, and I think it can be very useful to pick an object, like let's say a cup of tea. Um, Thich Nhat Hanh has this wonderful phrase in some of his teaching where he says, uh, even a child can see how there is a cloud in your tea. So thinking about the components um, of whatever it is that you're doing or being, let's say a cup of tea, the water in there, where did it come from? And where did it come from before that? And where's it going? And where's it going after that? And the different elements that make up the molecules of water, where do they come from? 
and it gets pretty cosmic pretty quickly. So you can think about that in terms of deep time or about travel across space. You can also think about it in terms of labor, in terms of work, like who had to work or do something to get that water into your kettle or to get that energy into your electricity uh, system. What labor, seen and unseen, is making the world possible for you? So yeah, I think maybe in terms of elements and in terms of like activity, um, might be two ways in. And so you can do that with a cup of tea. You could also do that with your body um, or the language you're using. Across time and across space. So yeah, those would be my invitations for that. Um, I'm just gonna put the names of these groups in the chat. One is called Stop Polluting Politics, very new, but you can find it on Instagram. And the other is called Can, but it doesn't have any online presence yet because um, we're very new. So um, I'm afraid you'll just have to trust me <laughs> on that one. There will be more information as we, as we get there. Um, okay, and then I had my little video in case anybody would like to, to see it. Um, somebody has also asked to repeat what I said about fear and anxiety. And briefly, I believe I talked about acknowledging that they're there rather than trying to push them away and taking care of them, like treating them with care and treating yourself with care because what fear and anxiety need is care they're sort of saying something's wrong and so to bring compassion and gentleness to those feelings and to allow them to to be um i feel like maybe i shouldn't say any more because even saying a little isn't Saying this all sometimes isn't quite right, but just because you asked that specifically, um, I repeated it. All right. So, thank you very much, everybody, for your practice. Um, please have a wonderful day. And, you know, if you like, drop some of these ideas into your day whether that's when you're making tea or whether that's at specific times, taking a moment to sigh or to breathe, take your attention down to your feet, that's another good one. And if you're here tomorrow, maybe we can share a little bit about how that's gone. All right, I wish you a wonderful day.